fish guy. Oh. Like, like the, the, the epistle guy wasn't a saint, apparently. <laughs> No, St. Thomas. St. Jude, Will? No. Okay, let me just, no. we are almost there, Drew. Thank you for your patience. It's Oh, it's yeah, I'll have to do that too. Closed captioning. I've got to get in my settings, it comes on automatically on mine. I want John, 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 John Peachy. There we go. This is me. Sorry, it's Paul. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, me too. Okay. Hello, Margo. Good to see you. All Hello. right. I think we are good to go here. Again, apologize for a little bit of a late start. Um, we are on Easter 5. <clears throat> and this, as we continue to walk through the Sundays after Easter or the Sundays of Easter, you know how we've talked about how there's like last Sunday was Good Shepherd Sunday, and we always hear from the 10th chapter of John. Well, this Sunday is Vine in the Branches Sunday, I guess you could say. Uh, so we typically hear from John. Um, it makes it a challenge because it's anytime we read the Gospels, we're taking just a pericope. By the way, that's what a pericope is, a little section of text. I remember when I first went to seminary, one of the second career kind of pastors who I was very rare, even 35 years ago that I went right from college to seminary. And they, they said, what's a pericope? And, <laughs> and I was like, you haven't heard that before. Anyway, pericope, it's a fancy word for what, what text are you looking, what pericope are you looking at? So we always have, um, you can't just say verse, you can't just say verses or <laughs> paragraph or your pericope, the assigned readings mm. for that Sunday. Aren't you glad you know especially that? Especially when you're in college. Yeah, especially mm -hmm. when you're in college or seminary. Yeah, so it's like their big words. Yeah, they all oh, they love their big words. Uh, so um we are where we are in John 15. 15 vine in the branches. You have to learn how to cope with a pericope. There you go. <laughs> Uh, and I believe it's one through eight, correct? Yes. yes. Yep. So yep. we we kind of stop. Why don't we go through the paragraph verse one. 11? The, the reason is that I think next year it'll be nine through something. You know, they, they carve it up to distribute it over the three years. All right. So let me say a prayer and we'll get started. Gracious and loving God, thank you for each person here. Let what we do today... Uh, be filled by, and led by your Holy Spirit, and let your word do its work, um, and we give thanks that we have been grafted into the vine, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Okay, who's reading? I will. All right, Kim. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. This is the ESV. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, 
He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. If anything does not abide in me, excuse me, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Thank you, Kim. Thanks be to God. All right. The true vine. <laughs> that makes me think there must be other vines. Uh -huh. What's fake vines, huh? Yeah. yeah. Fake. What are the fake vines? Yeah. Or what are the what are the dangerous vines? Yeah. Getting hooked with a dangerous vine sounds I'm scared. Well, no. yeah. you can think of what other what do people people that don't believe in the Lord, what's their God? Yeah. What do they make as their God? Yeah. Well, yeah. then I think of all the vines like uh, raspberry, you know, has little thorns on them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, <laughs> okay, don't want to be around those. Well, that's not the only one. Right. I and mean, there's a lot of yeah. um, fruit that have terrible thorns yeah. that are great fruit. But, mm -hmm. our, our raspberries aren't bad, but those Black Himalayan blackberries, blackberries yeah. too. that yeah. someone imported from Himalaya thought it was a good idea that have taken over the countryside here in Washington. They are delicious. And they're big, usually. Especially they're the not black. really vines, are they? They're not they're bushes, aren't they? The, the black, the, I, I always thought of them as vines, but because they'll go up a tree and they go everywhere. You know, but, oh. but that you call very shoots vines or not so but anyway yeah anyway um yeah the himalayan blackberry brutal they're awful but absolutely delicious mm -hmm. <laughs> find a place not next to the road because you don't want to get the uh exhaust on the berries yes. but and but uh and find a break to yeah and it's been find a place in the forest somewhere or off the road and you can have the best pies you can ever imagine. But you got to be careful. They'll rip you to shreds. I mean, they're whore. Usually, I always get them by golf courses, you know, because they've grown up on the side. Kitsap Lake had a spot, they got rid of them a year or so ago, where I can put it down and get all my blackberries. Okay, tangent. Um, uh, I am the vi true vine. Yes, yeah, so we put true vine, and that's interesting that there are other vines that people are plugged into, um, that they are, that are driving them, that are their God, you could say, what? <laughs> well, um, is that a reference in contrast to Israel being called a vine? Mm, just gonna go there. Okay. No, that's exactly what I thought about. Is there precedence for the vine, biblical, that metaphor, that analogy, in the Bible, and there is. Um, I was in the wrong thing. Let me do this, and I'll do this. And if we were to go to, I think, what is it? Isaiah. Is it nine? That's that famous passage. Where is the vine in the? I think it's maybe before this sign. Well, that's the commission. I think it's here. I'll find it. I can find it in different way. I have my vase. <laughs> my vase, I can find it. Um, the vineyard of the Lord. So uh, in the beginning of Isaiah, in chapter 5, 
So this, I'll take you back to the prophet Isaiah. This is the Isaiah speaking before the exile and you know, his commission that we hear about in chapter six is actually not an exciting one. You know, <laughs> uh, tell the people they're in trouble and and actually tell them there's nothing they can do to prevent it. It's this is going to happen. Um, and so the, we get this parable. Let me sing for my beloved my song, love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and he hewed out wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. Mm. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem, O oh, people or men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I had not done for it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? But now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. It will break. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and the briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the well, awesome. house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant planning. And look, he looked for justice. And but behold, bloodshed. Are those the wild grapes? The outcome of it, the fruit of their and for righteousness, but behold, a cry. Outcry. Um so yeah, so justice and righteousness. I believe this is uh Mishpat, yes. And then this would be Sad Sadiq. So this is this is the judgment upon the vine of Israel. Now this is before the exile, and this is clearly referring to the exile, in my view, that okay, you know, you guys are going to go off in the exile. But Jesus picks up on this. So I suppose we could. Do another search and just put fine. And whoops, uh, I've got it on New Testament. I got to get the whole Bible. Okay. Come on. So, yeah. So this fine bent its roots towards him. So we do get it as a metaphor quite a bit. Um, then each one of you will eat of his own vine. So sometimes it's it's talking about actual vines. Um, yeah. Let's see, but I think this one in Isaiah is the really um, the the metaphorical use of vineyard vow. So is that Israel? I think uh, so. So now Jesus says he is the vine. Okay, this actually, I didn't even see this coming. So thank you so much, Val. <laughs> so last night, maybe we can do a quick diversion here because I know you're interested in this. So last night I gathered the men for mandate under the topic Israel then and now. Ooh, um, yeah. a, that was a tough thing. Ooh, we filled the room. Yeah. Well, I found that whenever I do a controversial subject, there's about a, a, a third more guys that come. Wow. They want to talk about stuff like this. So that's cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think. What's that? I think we're 19. 19, yeah. Oh, that's great. So um, the then wasn't so difficult, but... But there are lots, but we did have to talk. The then flows into the now in this regard. Um, many people believe that when, you know, Israel disappears for a while in the exile, but God recreates them back in the land, and then the, the Greeks oppress them, and, but the Maccabean revolt 
gets rid of the Greeks and they have their own independent rule about like, and the geography roughly that of King Gunther. So there is this moment, you know, we, we're, we've, we've got our king back. We've got our, but internal strife and power battles weakened them. And of course the Romans come in and they take over. So even though the people still have their temple, the second temple was built. They have, they're doing their sacrifices. They are somewhat of a nation. They are, you know, they don't have independent rule though, government, but they're allowed to worship. The Roman empire looked at Judaism as an acceptable religion. They did not, you know, as long as you give us our due, you can do your thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but there was, I guess you could call it like almost Jewish nationalism. That's what a zealot was that wanted to get rid of the Romans. Well, they kept rebelling and Rome eventually came in and destroyed the second temple, Herod's great magnificent temple in 70 AD. And then there were two more revolts and the, and the Jewish people as a nation ceased to exist. <laughs> The diaspora, that's what it's, you've heard of that. So Jewish people went all throughout the world, Northern Europe, Germany, Germany, Poland, all mm -hmm. those, you know, countries. Um, they came to the United States too, <laughs> um, you know, uh, but there wasn't, not, a, ba not back in the first century, um, but eventually they would, and the Judaism that survives is, the Pharisees, the, the synagogue, the rab, rabbinical Judaism. You pray, you study the law, you apply the law to your life, and you celebrate God's choosing. So they still looked at themselves as the you know, chosen people. And that continues strong and survives to this day. But Israel as a nation, as a government entity, did not exist for close to 2,000 years. Um. 1900 years and then after the holocaust the united nations well first the ottoman empire was carved up after world war one sorry doug this is a repeat for you <laughs> why don't you give the mess to give this so the ottoman empire um you know collapsed after world war one and the different folks that you know britain france whatever they carved up that part of the world um, co colonization, all of that, and pal pa what we had to understand is Palestine or Israel today was the, under the British Palestine mandate, and so Britain ruled that area. Um, more and more Jewish people started to come back, and this was called Zionism. They they want a homeland. They want, mm -hmm. and so they come, and they were buying land. You know, um, some people say they they. They did it, you know, wrongly or illegally, but they bought the land and they resettled. But the more they resettled, the more tensions there were between Arabs. And so under the British rule, it got really bad, so bad that the British said no more. Or really cut it down, which made the Jewish settlers really mad. So they started to rebel against Britain's rule. Mm -hmm. They were against. And so... Um, so anyway, all this sectarian violence started and kept going. And then the Holocaust happens and the United Nations, in an effort to never have this happen again, felt like, you know, the Jewish people need their homeland. And thus they created the modern nation of Israel to some degree, but they created also a palace, what then became a Palestinian state. So you had these two state solutions. And the Palestinian, of course, the Palestinians were Arabs living in that area. You know, the, the borders were, I don't know that there was an exactly defined, you know. Um, um, and I won't go through the whole history, but a lot of the reason I do that much of the history is that a lot of people viewed the creation of modern Israel as a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. That, hey, you know, I, you know, God's going to renew, you know, whereas for us as Lutheran Christians, the vine of Israel, what does Jesus say he is? He says he is the vine. Now, dispensationalist Christians, as they're called a lot, usually in the Pentecostal circles and others, 
reject call this replacement theory and they hate it they think it's wrong etc but when i read the gospel of john jesus seems to me to step in the place of all kinds of things of the old testament he is the fulfillment when he died on the cross he says this is it's finished so i think it was finished and he came to fulfill the law and he so came to fulfill the law exactly so he did he went out in the wilderness and did what israel didn't do and couldn't do I don't blame the Jewish people. They're just, I'm worse. You know, I mean, they're just a good, you know, uh, reflect, you know, so, but, but they are, they do exemplify the human weakness. And the, so God chose Israel, bless you. Yeah, it's okay. You're fine. You're fine. Um, and, but many Christians reject that. They say, yeah, Jesus fulfilled all this, but God still has a place for Israel in God's salvation history. So, and then they go to Revelation and they do some kind of fancy, dancy mm -hmm. stuff. And so today, some people believe that the modern nation of Israel is God's creation to fulfill, you know, it's biblical. And they're called Christian Zionists. I don't believe that. Um, and it's okay if you do. We're all we're both going to be in heaven. You know, it's going to be fine. But the the danger part is then Israel gets a pass for how it, you know, because after all they're you know they're God's chosen. So, but but in truth, Israel is a secular state, or it was when it was created. It has a constitution. It's a democracy, and I believe it's. I am completely for Israel because I think if they didn't have Israel, there would have been another place. Just look at how people can't distinguish between the nation of Israel and Jewish people. I mean, you see all the anti-Semitism, the Jewish hate, you know, and it, it's extremely do troubling. Think, do you think you can really tell the difference between a Palestinian and a Jewish person? person? Oh, sure. You, you know, there is some ethnic... Um, a lot of Jewish people come from the Northern European countries and then coming back. And so, but, but some Jewish people, you can't, if you, you're Palestinian, you're, you're Jewish. I mean, it's hard for me, mm -hmm. but they, 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 the trouble of course, is the United Nations set up a, two nations by ethnicity or religion, or it's blurry. And that's dangerous because then you've got it. But, but, and so some people, want to call Israel a, a, an apartheid state, you know, because it, you know, a Jewish people, there's, Supreme, there's Arabs on the Supreme Court of Israel. People, mm -hmm. a lot of stuff like this gets overlooked when they talk about that. There's there's yeah, people there's... In, in political positions. There's about 20% of pe um, Arab people who are live in not the Palestinian part of Israel, but just Israel in general. So it's very complex. I'm not going into that. You know, that was mandate last night. For yeah. our purposes, when Val said... You, you, Cindy said, I'm the true vine. And then Val said, does that have Old Testament? Well, I think it does. I personally think Israel is vital, ally, needs to exist. Um, but I also think they can do really bad things, like our country has. Really good things, really bad. They're a democracy. Look at how they're fighting about Netanyahu right now. I mean, and about what he's doing. They they have a representative form of government. There's some problems in their constitution that allows for this a kind of stalemate, and but and they need to they need to fix that. But you know, they had fights about what their Supreme Court could say and do, and and you know that. So it's a government, and I think it's really important ally, and I think that you see like Iran's. You know, I personally think that this Hamas attack happened to stop the the agreement that was going to happen between Israel and Saudi Arabia. I think it was completely planned. It's because there were Arab countries that were saying, you know, okay, we're going to accept that Israel is here to stay, and we're going to start. And Hamas just this, this just torpedoed that whole the whole thing. But we don't need to get there. Bottom line. Like I say, the reason I brought this up and went into this whole long little branch is that I think Jesus is the true Israel now. I'm sorry. We don't need a nation of Israel to bring about the salvation of the world. We need Israel because Jewish people need protected, in my view. 
but nonetheless, um, uh, that that's just that's important. So Jesus now is the one by whom everyone is going to bless themselves and be blessed. Remember Abraham and Sarah, you know, blessed to be a blessing, and all nations will bless themselves through you. Well, Jesus is now the vine, and um, then we get grafted in. Um, Paul calls us. He uses the olive tree, but in in Romans nine through eleven, he says we are a wild olive shoot grafted into the tree. Us mm -hmm. Gentiles, mm -hmm. um, and then he says, "Don't get all puffed up because he can cut you off just like he cuts them." You know, so don't think you're something. You know, all you know, which Protestants have, or Gentiles have had problems with when they're anti, with their anti-Semitism. So, um, anyway, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else want to make a comment that I talk about for 25 minutes? Anyway, no, that's about, awesome. About verse yeah. 6. Verse 6. Is it, if anyone does not abide in me, they are thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burn. The Hamas? Yeah, this, this is where this... I'm sorry. Yeah, you want to... Yeah. Go ahead. Um, nothing has been mentioned about the Palestinian government. Right. And so who's ahead of that? And well, it's a real problem. Um, the, there's the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and then Gaza. It, it gets really complicated yeah. um, in my view, but Gaza, Israel withdrew. After the Six Day War, Israel had taken a huge chunk of Egypt, um, the Golan Heights, which they kept because they kept, not stupid. Well, they kept getting bombed and rockets lo and lobbed down on them from the high ground. And they said, we got to take that for our protection. Yeah. So, but after that, then I think it was either the Carter or the um, Clinton agreement that they, is, Israel withdrew from e Egypt. They gave that, all that land back to Egypt. And then they also, Gaza was given to the back they withdrew completely out of Gaza, and but because then of all the, the 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 fighting and the terrorist activity, Israel basically sealed them off, which made life hell for Palestinians. Yeah. But they would say, "We don't want to keep getting bombed," you know. And so it's kind of like almost like a "Who hit you? Hit me first, you know, type of thing. But we're talking about lives and families and you know, horrible. So, so the, Hamas won an election, I guess, back in the er, in the mid 2000s, and they've been in control, control ever since of Gaza. But a whole different set of Palestinians have been in control of the Palestinian Authority. And there's three levels. Anyway, it gets, it's, it's, it's complicated. complicated. Yeah. And I've, I listened to it from both sides. It's just crazy. But yeah, from the Jewish side, they'd say, hey, you know, we we don't see any evidence that the Palestinians are okay with the two. And Hamas is, of course, very upfront from the river to the sea. Get rid of Israel. I don't know where they want to send them, but anyway, um, anywhere else, you know. Yeah, but so, but then from the Jewish side, they want to get rid they've of made them. it, they've made it really, really hard. Um, and and some people would say, you know, created some of this strife with the way they treated the Palestinians, and off we go into the well, and the settlements too. That's the the settlements that they got in. I mean, I've heard explanations of that, um, but that to me is the the more egregious <clears throat> thing that Israel has done to you know cause problems. Um, I not like poking the bear. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, anyway. But we'll leave the current events, jump back. Uh, Doug mentioned verse six. This is a tough text. It's a wonderful text in a certain level, but this is one of those hard hitting texts that, you know, every branch that does not bear fruit is going to be cut off. And is a branch a person or is a branch a part of me? I love I, I if it's a part of me, I like it because I'm happy for God to prune something that's not 
bearing fruit. But are we talking about people here? You know, this is this yes, is, because a lot of the Bible is all double talk, double talk. I mean, they say one thing and mean another. Yeah, is this is that the way this is going, yeah. Karen? Um, um, what what do we do with this? So um, maybe before we get down to where Doug took us, let's start with this. The word abide in the gospel of John, meno, is like one of these joining treasure troves, a word that is so weighty and so important. Um, God abide, Jesus abides in God, and God abides in Jesus, menos. Um, and so now we're called to abide in Jesus. But note that he says that you have already been made, in verse 3, already you are clean because of the word I've spoken to you. So Jesus has cleaned away their sin. He, they, he has put them in the full, whatever way you want to talk about it. That word's the same as prune. Clean is the same as prune. That That's is really point. helpful. Um, every branch that is not catharsis, 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 cleansed, every branch that is not cleansed, um, and then you are clean, you are catharsis. That's awesome, Kim. Um, so, wow, that really helps us. So it's kind of like... Um, what is it, it, doesn't that mean you're, you repent your sins or your sins are forgiven? Is that what the clean means there? I think so. I think that you've received the word, you've heard the word, you've been repented and you've been made clean so you you are you're set now that that's true abide in jesus stick with him stay in that love and grace and forgiveness um and so where is the where then is the so when we talk about the fruit what do we think what do you think what does that represent what's the fruit of the spirit. Okay, so like Paul says, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Gentleness. What's that? Gentleness. Gentleness. There we go. And self-control. I think there's seven of them. Yeah. At some point I had to memorize them for something. Um, so that's probably, when we think of fruit, we think of love your neighbor. We think of... That's, that's doing things though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the um, do the things out of, because your heart's in the right place. Okay, so where does the fruit come from? Does it come from the law, or does it come from being attached to the vine and abiding in the vine? And then it just flows out. Yeah. Well, I was yeah. just, well, just thinking, you know, the the branches are fed. Through the sap, you know. Right. The right. Yeah. So that's where the fruit comes from. And it's just natural to think that way. But it reminds me of what Paul says in Romans 6 at the beginning, because he's just talked about how great much God gives his grace. And he says, What then shall we sin so that God's grace may abound? Because wherever there's sin, God gives more grace. Um and he says, may it never be. And then he doesn't run to the Ten Commandments. He runs to, you've been baptized. You've been connected to Christ. You've died with him. You've been raised with him. So similar to this, where does good fruit come from? Well, it flows from the vine through the branches to the fruit. So abiding, that's where true good works come from. Um, so, so it's the Holy Spirit, the sap? Yeah, it comes well. I think we can say that. Let me get a little farther away from you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I read something mind blowing a couple of days ago, and I've read on the freedom of the Christian many times, but mm. I hadn't picked up on this. Um, but Luther says that 
so so when we think of the freedom of the Christian, we are freed freed from having to make ourselves righteous. And now we are bound to our neighbor through that freedom, right? Yes. That freedom binds us. Yeah. And so I have always doubted that in relation to me, me and my works. But what Luther also said is that because we have this freedom in Christ, we put on Christ, we also put on our neighbor. And we put on our neighbor's sins and we enter into their suffering just like Christ does with us. Mm. And I mean, I had just never, you know, we think we talk about the the bridegroom and a bride and how each receives the other's goods basically in this yeah. relationship. But I had never thought of of us as Christians receiving all that is our neighbors, including their sin, and you know, uh hurts. Yeah. Including their hurts. Um that was have you did you I haven't honed in on I'll that either. Find that. So send that to me. It, that was, would be great. it was really yeah. convicting. Freedom of the Christian is one of Luther's early seminal big works with the Babylonian captivity of the church and the two kinds of righteousness. So um so that's the fruit of the spirit is being able to enter into your neighbor's suffering and to give them forgiveness and yeah. That is helpful. So that's where this text has something to do with suffering. Mm. Mm. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. Branches are again thrown in fire and burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And so maybe the ask whatever you wish is the not entering for yourself. Oh, not for yourself. It's entering in, entering into your neighbor's needs and life and and having wisdom on how to love and care. Being for an them. intercessor. Yeah. 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 And even you know, taking some of that upon yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, if you're abiding in Christ, that means you're taking up your cross and following him. And that, you know, that verse has always kind of confounded me and scared me, but that makes sense if, you know, it's just gonna happen. what happens on the cross, you're you're doing the same for your neighbor. Mm -hmm. It's just going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the context of 9 to 11 actually is loving me so high I've loved you and abiding in love. So that would actually be. Mm -hmm. Even though that's outside what we're talking about, it does correlate to the context yeah. of what you're bringing about to be expressions of love. So is the father to the son, so is the son yeah. to the humanity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Deep stuff. This is good. Um, can I make it? Uh, Please. Verse 11 I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you. He didn't say these things just to freak them out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he didn't, yeah. He didn't say these things. I mean, it's, they're trying to figure this out so much and they're following him. And then he says that I have said yeah. these things to you so that my joy may be in you. What a what a gift. Mm -hmm. I'm getting Jesus's joy. Um, yeah. I don't think their, their fear went away from me just, you know, feeling so back and forth. But, um, that is yeah. really great, Cindy. Why did Jesus tell not to get us freaked out about getting thrown into the fire and burned? Yeah. But yet that his art, his joy would be in us and our, we would have that life abundant. I, so we, to get this right is to, to find joy yeah. in this. So there's, so to get this right is there's a promise here. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and that your joy may be complete. So it's not like a like our joy would be in oh well just a little bit of joy. <laughs> no, it's no, filled up like okay. Play Roma, the yeah. really important moving Greek um, you know, fill up, overflowing, you know. And then he goes and we go right into this is my commandment that you love one another as I love yeah. you. And that whole thing is 
this it's a beautiful picture yeah you know i mean we could look at all these like i have looked at some of these like oh am i buried through oh am i gonna get cut off oh you know all of that but yeah that that part that you know that there's no joy in that it's just worry and fret and right and right. that i mean not that we can't be um questioning our our actions and what we do and what we say but um i i i just think jesus got something to say about that you know i i think there he's giving us hope in the pruning because there's two kinds of cutting that he speaks of cutting away the dead branch and pruning the good branch that's <sighs> abiding in him mm -hmm. so it's really yeah. you know that's how where your joy is coming from that hope I, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is another really important detail. Um, what does it mean to abide in Him? What does it mean? Perfect. Good question. What do you think, folks? I think we're abiding in Believe. Him. Okay. We're abiding yeah. right now. Jesus does throw on a little bit of help in verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. So it has something to do with his words. And so his promises, you know, um, his words, his commands too, I guess. <laughs> um, that... You know, if his words abide in us. So, yeah, yeah. When I think of the word abide, I, I like to think of, in this, I'd like to think of it, well, when people, um, okay, physically abiding somewhere, okay, you're living somewhere and you live off of what is provided. Yes. By, okay, you, know, you grow fruit and vegetables or something and you live off of those. So, Abiding means how you're sustained. And so think about um, us being sustained, mm -hmm. provided for by the Lord. Does it mean living like he lived? Be, be perfect as my heavenly father is perfect? Good question. He said, this is my command that you love one another as I love you. Well, if you're not perfect, then some you, there's going to be a little pruning going on. <laughs> and some of those pruned off parts might get thrown into the fire. Mm -hmm. But if that's just pruning parts of us that we need to get rid of, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I like that thought. I, I don't think you, you, you can't totally get rid of it. Because it's all, I mean, if, if, if you don't help your neighbor, it's a sin. Yeah. Yeah, and you you uh, you, you can't can't, ex you, 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 you can't all yeah. I mean, if I helped every neighbor that I have in one set or every need I have, I I would no wouldn't way. exist. You know, would, when, you when know. does somebody help me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, until the hun doesn't uh, <laughs> <I'll leave them laughs> <out there. laughs> um Isn't there a isn't there a Bible verse that says if a part of your body uh is it working? Is it working for the Lord? Did you supposed to cut it off? Or isn't that pruning? Is it something that we're not doing right to help create that's, the atmosphere that's that cost, God asked us to do? Yes, Jesus has that difficult <laughs> saying, if your eye is causing you to sin, pluck it out. And, and obviously he doesn't want us to get rid of our actual eyes or actual hands or feet. But, right. but yeah, but I think that sounds like, Doug said, that sounds like pruning to me. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, no, good, good, good. So great question, Carrie. What does it mean to abide? I, I think it means, I think, I think it, to some degree, it certainly means doing what Jesus has said to do as a way to abide in him. But I think it's not just that. It's believing and hearing his words really, really, you know, again, going back to that, a different metaphor of making yourself a big target for the Holy Spirit. Um, 
you know, being in worship, being receiving the Lord's Supper, hearing the word, studying the word, praying the word, singing the word, you know, that's what we do on Sundays. Most people don't realize that, but we're singing the word every Sunday. And um, so I think all of those things, and I think we definitely want to include the, you know, care of our neighbor and loving our loving um, is all a way that we abide. Um, Raymond Brown, who has probably the most important, one of the most important commentaries on John in the back of the first volume gives a special treatment of the really important words in John. And so I thought I'd read just a little of this to go at your question, Carrie. Can you see that up there? Is that big enough? John likes to use meneng to express the permanency of relationship between father and son and between son and Christian. Yet John does not make use of the many compounds of meneng um, that are frequent in other New Testament writings. In the Old Testament, permanence is a mark of God and what pertains to him as contrasted with the temporary and transitory aspect of man. So God is meneng, um, he is the living God, enduring, menon, forever. Wisdom, too, is enduring in herself and renews all things. In the New Testament, citing from Old Testament, the word of God abides forever. That's First Peter 1. Um, let's see. This atmosphere of the permanence of the divine had its influence on Johannine um, predilection for menon. The crowds in 1234 cite as an axiom, the Messiah is to remain menane forever. And since John presents Jesus as the Messiah and as the Son of God, all that pertains to Jesus must be permanent and remain forever. The Spirit was given to the prophets for a time, but the Spirit remains on Jesus. Now that's interesting. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and remain on him. That is really interesting. I'd never really thought about that. So the prophets, you know, the spirit would come and they'd prophesy, but then the spirit would go. But the spirit stays. Um, Menos on Jesus. The man who imitates Jesus by doing God's will endures forever. First John 2, 17. Um, the will of God abides forever. Um, but, okay, we got there's got to be a but here. But the Johannine use of mene is more complicated. For the study of this verb, especially in the formula mene n, n, introduces us to a whole problem of Johannine theology of imminence. Okay, do we know what imminence means? Imminent is like it's going to happen soon, but imminence is um, uh, la la la. Um, isn't that like intimate or like? Uh, I think like a with you kind of like with you yeah like 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 god is right there you know type of thing um well i can look it up in wikipedia excuse me that's not that's that's not the one we want is it yeah, it says the doctrine and the theory of it is hope that the divine encompasses or is manifest in the presence. It says okay, so divine. presence. There you go. Okay, of uh, the theories of divine presence. Okay, excellent, excellent. Sorry, Margo, you didn't see that probably, but um, uh, okay. So um, a remaining in one another that abind that binds together Father, Son, and the Christian believer. We bear in John. We hear in John that just as the Son is in the Father and the Father is in the Son, so is the Son to be in people, and people are to be in the Father and the Son. The verb here is a um, n to be in, but this is synonymous with menen n, except that menen, menen, that's the word remain or abide, has the added note of permanence. So you've got imminence, God, you're got you're that intimately connected to and um, to God's presence, but it's also has a sense of permanence. So imminence and permanence. Um, Menane is used for the indwelling more frequently in the epistles. That's the John epistles, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. The first use of menane for reciprocal indwelling gives the possibility of a secondary spiritual meaning to the more ordinary uses of menane. 
in John 1, 39, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, is the word mene. And they mene with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour, where the disciples stay with Jesus. Okay, are you still are you with this? You want to keep going? Before we analyze the joining concept of mutual indwelling, we may ask about the background of such an idea, the Old Testament picture of God's dwelling in the tabernacle or in the temple in the midst of Israel is no real help. Oh, I thought it was going to be. For in John, it is a question of God's dwelling in an individual. So the, the temple was God dwelling amidst the people. This now is dwelling in an individual. Perhaps a better parallel may be found in the frequent passages in the Old Testament where God's spirit or word is given to a prophet. Also, there is a passage like the wisdom, um, uh, although she is but one, she can do all things. And while remaining in herself, she renews all things. And every generation she passes into holy souls and makes them friends of God and prophets. So that's the wisdom of Solomon. Um, we don't have that in our Bible, do we? That's part of the author, but yeah, yeah, that's in the because he's a Catholic scholar, so he doesn't tend to make a distinguishing there. Where we are told that wisdom is enduring in herself. Blah, 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 blah. The idea of being in God is found in the Hellenistic world. True. Okay. The closest New Testament parallel to joining imminence is the frequent Pauline formula in Christ. This is what I'm remembering. I knew there was something good coming. So Paul often says, those who in Christ are reconciled. Those who are in Christ are justified. Those who are in Christ have the promise of salvation. Those who are in Christ have, are, have redemption. And in Christ is our sanctification. So being in Christ, that term is, if somebody said, you know, I, I, I know I've told the story a million times, but when a very well-meaning Baptist lady came to see my mom before she died, and she asked me, does your mom know the Lord, you know, <laughs> and although she knew she went to a Lutheran church her whole life, but she was still wanted to make sure she was saved. Um, I just said to her, I have absolute confidence she is in Christ. That's the biblical term. You know, again, find me a place where it says, did she make a personal decision for the Lord? You find me that in the New Testament. Just go. Good luck. Um, now, it does talk about belief and receiving and all these things. But if there's a term in Paul, it's being in Christ. And how does that happen? Well, we talk about the faith of our baptism. Um, and so, um, so now uh, Brown here says the abiding word is connected, is like Paul saying being in Christ. Jesus says, abide in me. Paul says, you're in Christ. And this happens to us and for us. Um, exegetes are not agreed on the precise import of Paul's formula, but many would associate it with Paul's concept of the body of Christ. Paul's unity formula does not have the same patterning on father-son relationship that is characteristic in Johannine imminent theology. In other words, Jesus is in God, we're in Jesus, that type of thing. However, there is a partial parallel between the Pauline thought that the spirit of God dwells in the Christian and joining thought that the paraclete remains with the disciple, menos with the disciples forever. Let's see. All right, that's fine. So we get this now turning the joining usage. I thought, just get there. Let's go. All right, here we go. Divine indwelling is an intimate union that expresses itself in a way of life lived in love. If we understand this truth, we shall avoid the mistaken identification of John's concept of indwelling with an exalted mysticism like that of Teresa or John of the Cross. So in other words, you know, even though Jesus, we abide in Jesus, we're not there yet. This divine mysticism, we're not like in some, no, you know, to remain in Jesus or in the Father or in one of the divine attributes gifts is intimately associated with keeping the commandments in the spirit of love. Anyway, all right, goes on. Um, with this, we'll finish here. With a struggle against the world and with bearing fruit, all basic Christian duties, thus indwelling is not the exclusive experience of chosen souls within the Christian community as the essentially constituted principle of all Christian life. Ah, maybe we did. That part's pretty Catholic. Yeah, it is very Catholic. Yeah. And that's the part I was like, hmm. Because to me, we would, just call, we would stop at the divine indwelling. Yes, 
um, and the giftedness and faith in that. Um, yeah, there's a blurring here, isn't there, between the, the branch and the fruit. <laughs> Um, and I, I think that's a huge reformation. I'm glad you said that, Kim, because this definitely is a learning experience. I love this commentary, but, you know, the big issue in the Reformation was there's a difference between the fruit of faith and faith. Don't mix those up. So we could probably say that our faith, our abiding is the branch. And as we do that, then fruit comes forth. But the church in Luther's day was saying, if you didn't have the fruit, you don't have the faith. And so you, you've got to do fruit in order to, to be, you know, you know, it's that have to thing. You've got to, in order, in order to really be, you know, a Christian, you, and to, so faith, you know, they love faith without works is dead, you know, but all Paul is, uh, James is saying there is that faith, if you have faith, there's going to be fruit, <laughs> but we don't say you got to have fruit. Otherwise there must be no, we don't, we don't reverse it that way. Um, and so that distinguishing the, the person that does this surprisingly well is John the Baptist go and bear fruit befitting repentance. He doesn't say go and bear fruit to show that you're to do your penance to get forgiveness. No, it says now that you're forgiven, you're repented. Let's see some fruit. <laughs> so the one flows from the other, but it's we, but our conscience wants to say, and I've had this in my foundations class many times. There's a person in the last class that just kept saying, well, there's got to be some evidence of faith. And I don't see enough of it in me. And I'm not sure I have enough faith. And I, you know, and, but see, he's reversing the order. Hear the word. And that's what I ended up telling you. I can still remember. I said, don't just stop worrying about it. If you want to worry about something, abide. Hear his word, hear his promise. Trust that the Holy Spirit will do the Spirit's work. Cling to it. Oh, you just have a little bit of faith? Perfect. Just the kind of person Jesus wants. There's, he, there's yeah. no difference in worrying about it, worrying whether you've done enough good works or worthy, worrying whether you have enough faith. It's the same, same thing. Well, yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, just trust the word, that the word will do its work. Okay, let's go back to verse three. Mm. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. I mean, that that's the promise that you have to, that you're abiding in. Absolutely. That is the promise you're abiding in. Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, we've done a good job here. Um, I still wrestle with some of the, but I love um, Loretta that you helped me with the diff pruning and the cutting off. That's that's helpful. Because the law cuts off, in my view, the preaching of the law cuts off. And but then, you know, to, to use a different analogy, we can be grafted back. Someone can be grafted back in, you know, the got the gospel cleans them and puts them back in. So it's not a, you know, a, um, a hopeless situation here. OK, do you want to do uh, Philip uh, and the eunuch on in Acts? What? Sure. Well, you find that yeah. that maybe not have been the good language there, but <laughs> yes, go ahead, Kim. The other thing that I think is neat about this, and that's kind of what like what Sidney was saying with talking about joy, is that this analogy is about grapes. This is not about protein and water and things that we need for existence. This is about something that brings joy to life, right? We, yeah. We don't need wine, but it it's a lovely thing to have, you know. I thought I had you until the last thing. Well, yeah, it's a gift. It's a the analogy that he's using is something that brings joy to people. It's a yes, you know, if used well. I mean, it can be abused certainly, but it's a yeah, and that's what like wine can be abused, uh -huh. but it's it's good. Mm -hmm. Got it. I just didn't get the last thing. So no, that's right. That's another thing that's so important. Joy. It's a, yeah. It's something part of the abundant life. For, yeah. You know. And the bummer is that we don't 
get that in our pericope. <laughs> we read on to it, but it, our pericope mm -hmm. stops at verse yeah. eight. So that's 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 slightly problematic because that last line really says, if you're getting this right, it's going to bring joy mm -hmm. and not fear and trembling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they have to put that in there. I think I'll just play this Bible study and just say, this is it, guys. Okay. Um, so here we are on the fifth Sunday of Easter. We're going to go to the first. Oh, what is happening here? Why? It's a weird thing, but that's not taking me right. To the first reading. Uh, we'll get there. So, oh, oh, back too far, sorry. Here we are, Acts 4. That's so weird. No, that's not okay. No, it's not. No, it's not oh, I think I know. Acts 8. Acts 8. Yeah, I went back I'm only more. on the fourth Sunday. <clears throat> Acts 8. There we go. There we go. All right. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. So this is a person that's got a lot of power, um, not to get too graphic, but a eunuch had certain parts removed, so there was no worry about them being in the presence of the queen. And, um, and in the Old Testament, this was really bad. These people could not go in the temple. They could not, they had, they were, you know, outside. This is, you know, problematic. And, and so they, this person's got a little bit stacked up against them. They're not a Jew, and they're they're from Ethiopia, and they're a eunuch. But he's clearly reading the um, and chanting, <laughs> um, as we hear Justin chanting. Yes, um, <laughs> chanting the scriptures. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, so he he has he's one of these God fearers that we hear about that. That not a Jew by ethnicity, but a Jew by belief. Um, and the Spirit said to Philip, go over and join his chariot. So I had one storyteller, pastor, friend do it this way. He, um, who was in charge of all of it. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit of the Lord. <laughs> anyway, he was reading. So he was getting juggled around, but he was reading while he was going. So somebody else must have been driving. There's no texting. So um, so anyway, that's kind of fun. Um, he had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning to the chariot. Um, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? Uh, so the spirit tells Philip what to do. Go over and join this chariot. I think Philip ran over and put his thumb out. Yeah, right. Like, how did he get on? <laughs> Do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I unless someone guides me? So he's not understanding Isaiah. And, the and he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Now, this is really important for a number of reasons, but we'll, we'll get to it. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shears is silent, he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can des describe this generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, now what is that text? I believe that's Isaiah 53, which if you were to read the whole chapter is, is, is a chapter that Christians have traditionally looked for. To talk to see what Jesus is doing in his crucifixion. 
suffering servant. Um, I'm sorry, Kim. The suffering servant. Yes, this one of the servant songs, suffering servant songs in Isaiah. There's five of them, and there are these little breaks throughout where the servant is it's that's the term the servant is going to redeem israel not by with mites of power and warfare but by suffering um jewish people today say that's israel uh and christians say no it's talking about jesus and i say it's both yes it might have been israel but now it's fulfilled in jesus and the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, as does the prophet, say this, about himself or about someone else? And yes, some people, this is important, so, and so, to this day, a lot of Jewish people believe that the prophet was speaking about himself, that I'm, the, I'm that spirit, but like in the third person type of. And the eunuch said to Philip, okay, and then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going, okay, so now let's just stop here. We um, Remember back a few weeks ago when we read uh, the resurrection appearance in the end of the Gospel of Luke after Emmaus where Jesus, it's uh, in the beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And I said to you, man, I wish mm -hmm. Jesus would have told, I mean, I wish Luke would have told us what Jesus what passages he was talking about. I want that sermon. <gasps> Maybe we get it here with Philip. We get a snippet. At least we get the text that he was talking about from what? Isaiah 53. Mm -hmm. I think that's fascinating. I think if you, like, Kim, keep your finger where you're at and just go to the book of Isaiah. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know if you lose your place. Yeah, just if you grab Isaiah okay. now, just open, just flip it open. Yeah, yeah, just when you get there. Okay, now hold up your Bible. I gotta see this. Oh, where it is? That's pretty much in the center, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, don't. It, it's just, it's just happens that Isaiah is pretty much right in the middle. Um, so this is this is what the you this Ethiopian is reading, and Philip does exactly what Jesus did. Beginning with the scripture, he told them the good news about Jesus. So I mean, this is really cool. A lot of people wrestle with what is the good news of Jesus, and some people want him to be a teacher. That's the good news of Jesus. He's just an enlightened rabbi that teaches us really cool stuff. And man, it's really cool. And I, you know, it's like the Doobie Brothers. Jesus is just all right with me, you know, do, do, do. You know, I mean, they want that Jesus, that cool Jesus who walks around. And But, but Philip is talking about the suffering servant. And if you read all of Isaiah 53, you know, it's pretty ugly. He's spit on, he's... You know, he's irreconcilable. He, you can't even recognize him. He's beat up so bad. Um, and that this is going to be a part of the saving work. Well, yeah, it is. So I just think this is interesting. Okay. Then Philip told him, and, and they were going along the road. He came to some water. And the eunuch said, okay, now, so he's preached the good news. Is this Evangelion? Yes, it is. So he preached the gospel. And I believe the gospel starts with Isaiah 53, um, moves to, the, you know, that he is raised, and we get some of that in Isaiah 53, and that the gospel is forgiveness of sins in his name, like Jesus said when he talked to this disciple. I think that's what the Ethiopian hears. And so he says, see, here's some water. What prevents me from being baptized? He's been a God fearer. He's been a he's he's a, a, a believer in Yahweh, and he's command and he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water. Evidently, there was some water alongside the road, and the eunuch and he bat and water Philip and the eunuch and Philip baptized him, 
And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went, but went on his way rejoicing. Now, doesn't that sound like Jesus, like in the road to Emmaus? He just, but Philip the same way. So here, Philip is really now Jesus' hands, feet, voice, mostly his voice, um, preaching. And so we see, what would the apostles do? Well, they do, they preach what Jesus preached. And I, I think that's powerful. Now, on a side note, um, what about this baptism? What do you think? Did Philip get, did the, did the eunuch get enough catechesis? <laughs> Evidently, what you need is to believe the gospel, what you've heard. You know, now we like to do, I before I baptize an adult, I usually have them go through my foundations class. But we've done baptisms here, and we did one for a Navy sailor who came in and said, well, do you know the gospel? Jesus died for you and raised for your sins and raised for your justification. He says, yes, I do. I believe that. And I've never been baptized. And he was going off to sea. So I grabbed family that was still around after church, and we went in, and we baptized him, because he didn't know when he was shipping out, you know, this time he's on a sub, so, um, well, that's not, I, if he was sticking around, I'd want him, I'd want to get to know him better, I'd want to do some more catechesis, I'd want to, you know, when I say catechesis, teaching, you know, the early church did that for 40 days of Lent, and then they baptized on the eve of Easter, um, for even over a year-long process. I think that is good, but right here, you know, this is the text. You believe, you know, baptize, get baptized. So we've done that. And then I say, do the more catechesis. But also, there's this ongoing, I don't want to say it's a silly debate, that what makes baptism, baptism? Is it immersion? Our Baptist friends say, if you're not immersed, <laughs> You're not baptized. Why did they do that? Baptizo means to immerse or oh. wash, but it also can be washed. Yeah. You know, and they say, you know, that's the way baptisms were done in Jesus' era, is that they were, you know, people went out to the river and they got bat, they went in under, you know, that that's that's real baptism. I wonder if there was enough water for this. Ethiopian to get completely immersed alongside the, <laughs> this is where are they at? Where are they going Desert. from? Jerusalem to Gaza. I don't know if you've ever been there, but there ain't big bodies of lakes and waters around. So it probably was kind of yucky water, truthfully. But anyway, he came up out of the water. So our Baptist friends want to say, oh, no, there must have been enough to get immersed. And of course, they also say it has to be when you're an adult because it's about you confirming you've made a decision for Jesus. Um, uh, and uh, we say, no, it's the giving of Jesus's decision for the person. And yes, faith is essential and it can be there in a little baby. Who are we to say that God, the Holy Spirit, doesn't give faith to a baby, but also um it's there in the parents and the sponsors and the church that surrounds them. So it's just a totally different way of looking at baptism. I wish it wasn't the case. I wish we didn't have that difference, but it is there within Christendom and the Lord will sort it out and however he wishes to. But I don't want to let baptism become something that is our work. Although it's ironic because a Baptist will, and I love Baptists, whoever's listening to this, okay? <laughs> I'm in awe of their commitment oftentimes and um, brothers in Christ. Some of the reformers of the past probably couldn't say that, but, you know, we're in a different world and, you know, I I know you can make the case with as from a Baptist viewpoint, but, um you know, but ironically, Baptists think that we think it's like this magic ritual that saves people. That's the way they say that. And it's like, no, this is God doing God's work. It's God 
It's God's word with the water that does it. This is what our catechism, Luther says in the catechism. So, um, so at any rate, they came up. The spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, but Philip found himself in, um, and, and the eunuch saw him no more, but went away rejoicing. Back to that joy, Cindy. Uh, so there's a lovely connection. Philip found himself at Azotus, and he passed through the through. He preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. I, I yeah, love, well, yeah. So what if 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 Philip? What is it? Well, you want to be Baptist, okay? Well, we've got some things for you to read, and we've got some things for you to talk about, and we should probably spend another two or three hours. You know, blah 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 blah. Hey, this Holy Spirit works a lot faster than that. <laughs> Certainly a lot can. Faster. Certainly you know? can. I mean, it's not us; it's the Spirit. Yeah. That's right. Doing it. Right. Right. And that's what how I see it. Or let's let's keep going with your line of thought. Or if Philip would have said, "Now let me make sure that you're doing a pretty good job on those Ten Commandments." Yeah. Or let me make sure you've got the right lineage. You know, you are an Ethiopian. And or what, let me make sure you've got the right hair color. And or, what, would, would he, he, what would he do? Yeah. It's like he'd have, we're just planting doubt. Yeah, and he would go life. away sad, and he yeah, would be like, okay. oh, he'd be turning. Yeah. But no, he says, there isn't anything to prevent. Yeah. <laughs> Let's well, stop. He kind of, kind of sounds like he thinks there might be because of maybe the context in which he sees right. himself before. Right. I'm... I'm a uh, so damaged once he gets goods. that reassurance, which is that isn't that in uh, do, uh, Isaiah 50, is it 56, where it talks about the eunuchs being able to yes, be brought in? Yes, there'll become a time when the eunuchs are brought in. Yeah. That's correct. I so don't I'm remember. wondering if that was actually maybe discussed is, at all, or he had Oh, I bet you in my ESV, it's going to say maybe that it's going to. Um, it sounds like he is thinking, oh, you know, this seems too good to be true, almost like that I could be. Yeah, just found a really cool textual variant. Um, uh, yeah, he, that he's thinking, I th there's a problem. I'm damaged goods. 56, yeah. 3 through 5. In please, my little note. please. I don't have, I didn't look at it. Oh, okay, no, no. <laughs> 50, said, so it is there. Yeah, there. I bet you. It's... So it's just a couple chapters away from what the 53. Um. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. And I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. Yes. So I'm just wondering if he got to read that. Mm. I don't know. He was it's, reading Isaiah. I don't know. It's interesting to see that there is in your scripture there, there is not a verse 37. Yes. Okay. All right. So that's the cool variant. One last little detail. Let's let's, here. let's do that. Yeah. Um, all right, right here. Uh I've got a footnote that explains it too, but so some manuscripts add all or most of verse 37. So they add a little more. And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. That is, you may get baptized. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So, in, I'm quite sure, what, Marash, you got your King James? No, I got it. Okay, does it say, does it, what is, does it say that in your King James? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There it is. So, if you want more info on this, come to my Sunday class this Sunday, uh, or go back to the last two recordings. The Textus Receptus, which is the basis for the Greek New Testament that Erasmus, 500 years ago, created. He took like four or five of the best manuscripts that he had that, of course, were copies of copies, you know, going way back. But that that Greek New Testament that he made, that Luther used and the King James Bible used, had these verses. But now we've discovered even more ancient ones that don't have it. 
that don't have that verse. So we've discovered manuscripts that date back to the 300s, whereas Erasmus's manuscripts were like 1100,000 AD. So they were much, but we also can now get more precise and think that they came from a little bit different strand, you know, tradition or strand. They scholar textual scholars try and identify about five different like if this is the original here, that the copies that were made in different geographical areas tended to have some traits that you could kind of identify. Well, the Textus Receptus that the Latin Vulgate was translated from and that, that the churches had accepted as the Bible um, is what we had until the last 200 years, especially the last 100 years, where now we've discovered all these older manuscripts and they are in not many places, but in this place, differ. Mm. They don't have this. Now, so what do textual critics have to do? Which one was the original? Now, let's see. Is it more likely that these verses were taken out? Or is it more likely that they were added? Well, just think of it, common sense. What, what, somewhere in the tradition, they said, you know, I bet you, <laughs> Philip asked for a confession of faith, like, and the Ethiopian, because that's what we do when we baptize. And so it's more likely it got added. Now, it doesn't change the meaning of the text. Although it's kind of cool, I mean, that it kind of does. It does. It. How, <laughs> does, how, does it? how does it? How does it? Well, how does it? because there's not a darn thing you have to do. Okay. Well, and if, if you're talking to people who insist on a confession of faith before baptism, therefore saying that infants can't, or you have to have yes. some actual confession by the person themselves, they would go to this text and say they they would probably do that. Yeah. yeah possibly go to this text, and then yeah. that's that's a kind of a, this is an evidence that that's what happened every single time somebody was baptized, which is done, but it's not done necessarily by the person themselves if you have yes, that yeah. other thing. Is that what you were thinking, Kim? Yeah, well, and I like how we, how this question is presented. What prevents me from being baptized? It's it's not, what do thing. I have to do to I be know. baptized? Or what do mm, you have to yeah, do to nice. baptize me? Yeah. Nice. It's like, it's yeah. what prevents from being baptized. Nice. And, and yeah. it doesn't look like there's anything. Yeah, if you're yeah. asking to be. Yeah, he, yeah. in yeah. essence, he wants, I want to, can I, you know, can I, and that is a kind of confession of faith, I guess you yes. could say. But yeah, I like that. And so there isn't a, you know, I, and it's interesting that the folks that are the King James only folks who want the Texas Receptus to be, it's ironic because it was the Catholic thing, but the King James are only -ers, Um this would be an example where they would say, see, this is a corruption of the text. This is, you know, the, the Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, that, that's all wrong. It went wrong somewhere. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I, think, um, e I think even with that ad, it's, you know, if an adult gets baptized today, we they okay. confess their faith exactly. as they get baptized. But yeah, it's it it's not a like it's a condition. Condi that's not conditional. It's not yeah. a condition. Yeah. So I get that. And I think that is a nuance that's really good. That's well, really what good. it does is it excludes people that can't confess. Mm. Mm -hmm. Or it could. You could take it that way. Well, and then know? it's it's also, you know, they said he said, What's to prevent me? So that's saying, okay. What do I have to do? Mm -hmm. I mean, you flip it over like yeah. that. What do I have to do? He might have lost the guy, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. But he just said, and you know, and, well, and he and couldn't I, get into the temple, right? Yeah. So that would have prevented him. His condition would have prevented him from getting in the temple. So is that going to exclude me from being baptized? Yeah, no. Yeah, there's, I, I, and and this is where even with the Texas Receptus, the the these verses added, it, it, Philip still doesn't say, "Well, you've got to change who you are. You got to do that." He yeah, says, yeah. "Faith." Yeah, that's faith. True. Yeah, exactly. So in that regard, yeah, it's 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 
you know, not this, but I, I think the nuance, and see, this is exactly what these textual variants, mm -hmm. they have a nuance to them. And so they're important. Mm -hmm. Well, um, and there is a confession in infant baptism that's by the sponsors, right? Right. By the congregation, right. So. right. And so we would, and, and obviously the Catholic Church loves the Texas receptors. Mm -hmm. So they, they would say, and they baptize infants, but they would then say, well, that's what this, like we do as Lutherans, mm -hmm. that's what, that's what sponsors and parents do um, mm -hmm. for, and the church does for them. But no, I like that, that in the original, what's to prevent me? Stop the thing, let's go. And they go in. I think that's cool. But yeah, so that's, I'm glad. I, I, had, I had never paid attention to that. In fact, and, but now I know I'll, you'll be hearing this again in my class on Sunday because we're just going to do various textual variants, as many as we can in, in 50 minutes. And since it's the first reading for this Sunday, we're definitely going to take a quick look at this one after we do Mark. 16. I think if the Ethiopian had needed more, then the spirit of wouldn't have taken Philip away that quick. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Right. He he got all he needed because yeah. he heard the good news. Yeah. Um, I, I also just real quick to finish here, something that we miss in Greek um with our English translation. And and, I, and sometimes I almost wish there was a translation that just had a particular focus on this, but this is the way this should read. And he passed through, he gospeled the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. It's the same word. It's the verb of the noun. He preached the gospel, gospel noun, preached is, go is gospel. It's, it's good news. He good news the good news. And I just, I just think that's important to uh, understand. Um, okay, let's close. Thank you, God, for this great study and for your word that makes us clean. Uh, we need it. And so we pray we will abide in you and you in us um, until the day when we, that abiding will be fulfilled in the kingdom to come. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Bye. Amen. Thanks, Margo. Take care. Yeah. Excellent, fun, good stuff. You guys, you guys are quite the scholar. Okay. I get all kinds of good stuff out of this. I don't know whether I want to preach on the vine and the branches now. I think I want to do I kind of want to talk about Philip. Yeah, you did the vine and the branches last year, didn't you? I think I did. I think you did. I did. Ooh, You're right. I may have to I may have to do a little switch gears here. Especially without those last nine through eleven verses and helping out a little bit on the